week, it seems another source of tension further strains relations between the U.S. and China. That tension is now such a dominant theme, it's easy to forget that countless cultural exchanges are also going on simultaneously. So what role can film and the arts more broadly play in nurturing cross-cultural understanding? And can something like a joint Chinese-American film production help soften some of the hard feelings fostered by the Sino-U.S. political tensions. Joining me for this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, in our Beijing studio are Stephen Nia, chairman of the World Film Institute, which okay. aims to promote the film industry globally, especially as a platform for cultural awareness, and Professor Joanna Cheng, mm -hmm. an intellectual critic. Welcome to both of you to The Point. So, Thank you. Thank you, and uh, yes, a very big question and asked in my leading, which is what role can film play in nurturing cross-cultural understanding? Mm -hmm. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the background, the kind okay. of atmosphere in the United States towards cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges with China. Absolutely. Stephen, what is, your, what is your feeling? I think um, as filmmakers, we have special responsibility social responsibility to illuminate and to highlight the cultural harmony that could exist between the people of two great nations such as US and China. I understand there are ripples and there are controversies but these are the times that as filmmakers we actually have the highest responsibility to do what we do best and to deliver the message that we, the people, really have no conflict. We have desire for friendship, as we have always had, and we need to overcome. And I think film being a really very powerful medium of communication and cultural exchange and artistic expression mm -hmm. uh, will have a very big responsibility to give that message and be very clear about that. In Hollywood, among the film professionals, the cinema goers, what kind of atmosphere is there when it comes to China, you are perceiving? Well, is it a difficult <coughs> time? Um, as the chairman of Wardour Studios, Hollywood Wardour Studios, I want to tell you, I talk to many, many colleagues in the, in the industry. And, um, Yes, there's always differences of opinion. There are opinions on both sides of the aisle. But I think overall, people in the film industry are not so much concerned about the conflict, about the uh, commercial aspect of the conflict, or even the political aspects of the conflict. I think we, as an industry, focus on delivering a message of unity and really our job is to deliver entertainment and deliver content with positive and meaningful message and I think that's what most people that I am in contact with uh, would agree with and that's what we are doing. Hmm. Joanna, what is your perception? You're more on the East Coast and also yeah, traveling between China and the United States. What has been your perception? Uh, the kind of uh, feeling among ordinary people in America affected by the kind well, of tensions I, and I especially reporting about China on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, there are not too many or too much reporting about China on a daily basis and I think I couldn't agree more with Stephen about the harmony that we must as a filmmaker uh, take on the road to to really do something to bring the world together. However, there are great diversities in this world, even great differences that Liu Xin is sensitively uh, pointing it out. The world is now in a great chaos. So we as a filmmaker must rise above to, to really ex explore the difference of different cultures. The, the, environment in the United States right now and about China. I, I am afraid it become uh, a little bit more like t tense, if not hostile, because the image of China, I'm afraid that China itself should really improve in telling a global story. That remains to be a challenge from the point of view of Chinese filmmaker, if not the government. So now we have filmmaker uh, like Stephen coming here to make a story perhaps about Shaolin Temple. You see, all these resources, 
is being exploited by chi by Hollywood. Chinese filmmakers need to rise above to really work hand in hand with with Hollywood filmmaker. That probably would be the better approach. Yeah, uh, you yeah. mentioned a very interesting topic, uh, Shaolin Temple, that has been very much exploited by Chinese filmmakers. But uh, what intrigued you about it, mm -hmm. and what you want to show with it? Um, actually, as you just mentioned, there ha there have been many many movies made about the Shaolin Temple, but most of these movies, in my opinion, have touched the surface. They only focus on kung fu, and usually they show the Shaolin Temple at a past time zone, like 500 years ago or several hundred years ago. I believe that the culture of Shaolin has special significance. And, and, and in this particular movie, Crossroads to Shaolin, okay. we are telling the story of a young American boxer who is simply not making it. He cannot become the champion that he always desired to be and I won't give you all the story, but very briefly, until through one of his friends, he comes to China, and he, one way or another, ends up in the Shaolin Temple. And he realizes, once he gets in and gets accepted and goes, gets indoctrinated and starts training in the Shaolin Temple, he realizes that the power is not really for a boxer, is not really in the muscle. The real power is a state of mind is a culture, is, a, is really an elevation of self and self-recognition and knowing and self-discovery. And I think what I want to show in this film is how this element of Shaolin culture, of course we have Kung Fu, we have Shaolin, we talk about the Shaolin medicine, Shaolin farming, all the different aspects, but particularly the culture is what really, really matters in for a person who wants to really become enlightened. And this boxer ends up, after going through this, of course there's a romantic love story behind it and all of that, he ends up back in Las Vegas and becomes the world champion. Mm -hmm. So it's a very inspirational story and also tells in a very uh, un indirect way the really significance of what he learns through his contact. And this is how cultures become closer together. Joanna, what is your first impression upon hearing the story? Well, re very reminiscent to Karate Kid and other uh, co-productions of uh, between here and, and the United States. There's also uh, delve into the uh, martial art aspect of Chinese culture. But in fact, 5,000 years of Chinese history really lies upon its mind. Its mind. Exactly. That's why. It's that's not why. just martial arts. Exactly. It's not just martial arts. And, and again, it's a story of how the outsider become the insider. Yes. So he become himself. So this is a, a journey of transformation and discovery. And I would be uh, very expecting you telling a refreshing story <laughs> with your like yeah. Thank you. Star here. Thank you. Do you think, that, is there any concern that you have because of the political tension between the two countries? I mean, politically, really, it has gone really bad. I mean, every day we're reading in the news the, the, the bill on Hong Kong, the bill on Xinjiang, China very, very angry with the United States Congress, if not the gov and with some members of the government. Are you not concerned that at this moment, if you do a story, about the, you know, about China, about Chinese culture, Chinese people, um, you might have some questions asked at least. I would love those questions to be asked. I would welcome those questions because, as I said, this is the time as filmmakers we must step up to the plate. We must really rise above all of those disputes and really convey what we need to say to the people. And this message is for the people, is for the viewers on both sides of the aisle, that despite all for of these... For both sides of the Pacific Ocean. For both sides of the Pacific Ocean, exactly. And I'm really looking forward to delivering this message because it's a positive, inspiring message. And I think it's a very heartwarming message. And I think both cultures will really appreciate this gesture of friendship, this gesture of unity that two great nations of U.S. and China really deserve to have. Hmm. Joanna, how do you look at the fact that uh, we've seen some joint productions or some marriages of 
you know, Western Chinese culture and collaboration between artists from both sides of the Pacific, but not so many yet. And it seems that it is still something that people like Stephen continue to explore. And the success story, well, I, I know the panda, the, the, the Kung Fu Panda series could be one, but um, relatively few. How do you look at the kind of uh, experiments, let's say, that people like Stephen has been undertaking? Well, actually, Hollywood have, uh, has actually a long history doing business with China. Hollywood by now have learned or mastered its art of appeasement almost. They, they know how to pander or learn or tap into the Chinese market, which is supposed to be the world's largest by 2020, they say. So that's why this is a high time for a global joint venture to be in place. Place. So a story uh, like a Shaolin Temple or Panda or Chinese icon need to be really studied very closely from the cinematic point of view. What's the advantage of uh, American filmmakers versus Chinese filmmakers exploring the Chinese cultural icons and trying to export it to the United States or other foreign countries? I believe the American filmmaker have a pair of fresh eyes who can tell the story from a global perspective because Hollywood is the role model for all to learn how to tell a story from a, a universal point of view. Uh, a local story to be told by Stephen perhaps is very universal. That is the challenge how Chinese filmmakers need to learn from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I know Ch China has learned all these special effects, uh, but how to tell the story in a global way, but really bring out the local story is the future challenge for all Chinese it's filmmakers. Also, it's also natural, right? At, at the end of the day, I was, for instance, I, I'm born Chinese. I grew up in China largely. I lived abroad, but at the end of the day, the Chinese element is, is overwhelming for me. So for a lot of Chinese filmmakers, it's inevitable, and it's difficult difficult for them to put themselves completely from uh, a different perspective right. and there, yes. But I think what, what one point that uh, Joanna just brought out, which is extremely significant, and that's the Hollywood way of telling a story. That, I think, is going to bring a new perspective. And a what fresh exactly look. is the Hollywood way of telling a story? Okay. Um, there are many films that are made in different parts of the world. And, and, and you notice that in, in some cases, especially in situations on a film such as this, the films tend to sort of shift a little bit towards a documentary type of a presentation of a story. They, they tend to sh sort of show, try to explicitly explain the history behind something. But because the way, he doesn't really know too much right, about Chinese history. But the though. way the Hollywood way of telling the story is really take a character, take a character such as a hero and tell the story from the point of view of that hero and in the background of that story, these are personal experiences of a hero, uh, whether it's a love experience, whether it's a social experience, cultural experience and in the background of that story tell indirectly all the other elements that need to be told. Remember, in filmmaking, you must first capture the heart of the audience who are watching the film. And in fact, you must do that in the first 10, 5 to 10 minutes of the film. If you fail to do that, mm. then the rest of the film is really meaningless. I understand that. Well, I would say there have been um, some Chinese movies which have uh, been box office blockbusters yes. here in China and, yes. and I have uh, watched them. Although they might not have been very successful in the American market, but in the Chinese market I've seen some movies and they also tell the story of a certain character, the hero for instance. And they, they do tell a, a, a quite complete story and they receive quite a big quite a high claim among the domestic audience and I wonder why this is not considered the Hollywood style. I mean, I don't know okay. what, how I many will, Chinese will, movies have that. you watched? I yes. address, no, I have watched uh, uh, at least a few, yeah, what's maybe more than a few, but I'll, I'll address that. I think it's the question of context. Um, when a Chinese a filmmaker tells a Chinese story, because culturally he already understands the context and, and, and also he knows all the viewers in China also understand the context. He will not pay as much attention to the background and the context of the character. But when, when an outsider 
okay, like myself or, or Joanna, or when we make a movie about a particular hero and a particular relationship telling the story, we really have to build that context. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot assume that the American audience or the European audience really no. understand that context. True. So we build that context and then the hero becomes more meaningful. Um, think about uh, the American movies, you know, what they have created. Many of them come and, and shown and very popular in China. So it's not a matter whether you can do it or whether, but rather a matter of, you know, how to do it or not. I think it's Content not that matters. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. That's a fundamental and, difference. And you say the American films have been successful in China. This goes exactly to what, what I was pointing out. Because the, the story is told, the context is complete, and of course, the theatrics and the visual effects and all of that makes it very exciting and so on and so forth. So when those films come not only to China, but across the globe, they tend to have a higher impact. Okay, we're going to take a very short break, and you have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back, and my guests have been Stephen Nia, chairman of the World Film Institute, and Joanna Chen, an intellectual critic. So we have been talking about uh, Western efforts to make movies about China versus Chinese efforts to make movies about ourselves. It seems that uh, the former has been more successful, and yet there have been people who are critical as well of uh, the, the, the first effort, saying sometimes they're not... Uh, respecting the Chinese cultural icon enough. For instance, when they made the Kung Fu Panda, the Kung Fu Panda had some kind of detail, like he was, you know, cleaning his nose on his, oh, I <laughs> on his sleeve. I, I uh, but some people, some people do feel that by showing that kind of thing, it gives people uh, automatically the, the impression that Chinese kids are like that, or it's acceptable in Chinese culture to do, you know, to wipe your nose like that, whereas it is not. So you might disagree, <coughs> but some people really do think that way. And I want to ask, I want to ask Stephen here, how, sensit how sensitive are you towards, you know, the sensitivities of mm -hmm. the Chinese Very culture, good and Very how good. you're going to handle that? Very good question. In fact. We have been extremely careful about this particular aspect because we've seen failures on some very big, big budget movies that did not pay attention to these details. So because of that, we have arranged with the Shaolin Temple and, and I have personally spoken about this matter to uh, Abbot uh, Xiong Shen and, and I have had, I've spent at least two hours talking about this and he's been kind enough to allow us to spend time to talk to the masters of Shaolin, to go through the story with them very carefully and bring, really get, bring their feedback, bring their suggestions, learn from them about these details so we don't make these kinds of trivial mistakes. And these are not trivial, by the way. They are small mistakes, but they end up being extremely important. I, I understand, yeah. but the audience need to be more sophisticated. When, when we talk about Panda doing those kind of things, that's perhaps a comedy. Comedy introduced humor, so a, a, some cultural discrepancy is okay. But perhaps Stephen is doing another genre which ask for accuracy and cultural sensitivity. So the audience should be more mature. So in it's true, I understand that audience should be more mature, but sometimes audience say you should show more <laughs> sensitivity. You, need, you see, it's a, it's a, it's a process. Absolutely. You can, yeah, some people always take it uh, different, uh, the way, uh, in a different way than uh, how you intend to. But um, Stephen, again, I want to ask you about maybe specific anecdotes or examples or details that you want to highlight and why you choose that kind of details because that's when uh, you know the, what you have been talking about can be illustrated <coughs> more clearly to our audience. Well, uh, I'll give you an example. For example, Crazy Rich Asians as a movie, right? This movie did well in, in the American box office, but, but failed in not China, here. totally yeah. miserably failed Why in China. Why do you China. think it's that? Exactly because of this point, because they, they made certain things trivial. They created an impression of Chinese, rich Chinese, that really was a bit offensive, actually, 
to people who of who are sophisticated and actually have um, you know education wealth and so on and so forth so we really really in my opinion we need to avoid that because this movie our movie and I'm sure the other movies were also intended but in this case we are really careful because this movie we expect it to do great in the China box office and we don't want to be stuck with situations where Chinese audience look at what we are doing whether it's in terms of Kung Fu choreography culture and make really really silly mistakes so we are that's why we are so careful about this issue mm -hmm. that's why we're spending this time specifically as a part of our pre-production in the Shaolin Temple to really come up to speed mm -hmm. on these details Joanna why do you think that this movie uh, Crazy Rich Asians Crazy failed? Rich Asians is not about China it's not about Chinese people uh, it's, it's about a, a certain ch people with Chinese background. Their story does not really relate to Chinese uh, audience in, in, in a dramatic way. China these days needs a story that relate to its own audience. Their personal growth, the country's growth, need to be reflected in cinematic works. So good films like So Long My Son by Wang Xiaoshuai is one of the best films of the year and that, that introduce realism to, to, to cinema. Films that really introduce history of China, not necessarily about the, I mean, the glorification of the rich people. That's why the Chinese audience does not relate to that. But it will relate to stories that incorporate Chinese uh, elements that has a universal uh, story structure. So, some some brainstorming for how to make um, for the Chinese um, filmmakers to make a good story about themselves which can be related to by audiences around the world. Any idea on that? I think it has been a particularly difficult journey, right? We had in, yes. in the 1980s, 90s, uh, Mr. Zhang Yimou, who had been relatively successful, but his movies were criticized by many here in China for showing the negative, more backward side this of China, which is already not the, which was not the case anymore. And now, if you, th if you, if you count the, the, the kind of... Uh, uh, movies, Chinese movies that are successful internationally, um, not so many. So what kind of, what can they explore? In well, order I to think do that? a film has to be existing as film, not as a political tool. When we criticize Zhang Yimou's film, I'm afraid we are putting on a political pair of glasses. I mean, because of those film of 80s, the world began to know China as a society. Today, China as a society, proposing itself as the world's largest or the strongest superpower. No, but no, China is not there yet. We never say that. <laughs> Probably, I, I would love to be way. wrong. We're on the second side. largest economy. <laughs> exactly. We always say the second but largest. In, in terms and of per film, capita term, even smaller. <laughs> okay, great. So we need more friends. So, but as a film market, True. China will be the world's number one market. But in terms of content, content producing power in China right now is urgently need to be, I mean, upgraded. And so Chinese filmmaker is facing a great challenge to tell their story. Right. How to do it? I think they really need to dive into their resources of legends, of all these uh, creative stories. I mean, learning from the, the Asians, but using it uh, with more creativity. I think the political environment needs to be loosened a little bit for them to be really creative, to study human as a human without political agenda. Mm. Stephen, your, your uh, thing. You know, um, uh, I, yes, there are, there are very good points here uh, that Joanna made, and I want to add another uh, very important aspect. Traditionally, uh, we've seen Hollywood studios really come to China for primarily for two things. One, to get capital, to get take back and make a movie, and then bring the movie back here to monetize and capitalize on the big market of China. At Water Studios, we have a completely different perspective of this process. I believe, personally, that right now, China is going through a cultural renaissance. And this is really, really an important era. And I give that credit, really, to President Xi in terms of his vision of creating this cultural renaissance and wanting the world to know about China and wanting the world to understand what is Chinese culture, what is the depth of this ancient, fantastic culture. So our strategy has always been not to come here to take capital out to make a movie, but to bring the Hollywood expertise and the Hollywood team to China 
and produce things here and collaborate with the Chinese filmmakers. And really, this type of collaboration, one-on-one -on -one close working collaboration, is the best tool to elevate and to achieve what Joanna just mentioned, which is to bring up the level of the filmmaking. And this is the process, and, and our formula has been extremely successful, and I'm really looking forward to implementing this. China has tremendous amount of talent. China has plenty of capital, and people eager to learn. Really hardworking and disciplined, young and of all ages. So what is missing is that element, the elements of Hollywood, including the storytelling, including production techniques and post-production and all of that. Do you think there could be a Chinese way of telling a story that can also be successful? Maybe not always a Hollywood story. Well, yes, uh, yes. yes. I, and, and, I, and I didn't mean to make a cliche about the Hollywood. I'm just using that as an example. Any good way of telling a story is fine. In fact, storytelling could, should be very diversified. I think China must produce its own filmmakers to tell yes. the story Chinese way to be accepted uh, what by is the, the world. the Chinese way? That I is mean, the, that the, the is Chinese the big way question. is to understand China. That is not the center of the world, but part of the world. And to really learn the other cultures, to embrace the other perspectives, perhaps sometimes to be taking a little bit back seat without imposing your own mm. values and this and that. But I think it's changing a, values. I think for the Chinese audience, primarily, there is a great sense of uh, need for comfort or the sense of security that finally, you know, the Chinese people feel secure and safe and they're proud of that. I think a lot of people go to the cinema and they get that kind of re confirmation. That's why they are they're going there in droves and they are really touched. They really can relate to that because it's not uh, something that just happened overnight. It's, it's through the w hard work of many of these people who are in the cinema. Exactly. That's why they really shed their tears. So yeah. it's not something that just, you know, told, th told them through loudspeakers, hey, you believe mm. in this because they lived it. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, they, as you said, I agree that China need to take a step back and, you know, not thinking we are the only people, our feeling are the only important feelings in the world. But I think it's a very fine balance and it's going to take some time until people are able to Absolutely. open up. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, along that's exactly correct. It is, a, it is a process, and we have to go through this process. And I'm also happy to report that Water Studios is now collaborating with the Heiko um, University of Economics. We are creating a uh, Water Studios Academy, which is a film academy. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it's this academy will ensure this type of cross-cultural you know, harmony and teaching and we are going to bring experts from not only from Hollywood, from across the world, and use experts from China to teach the next generation of filmmakers. Exactly. This Education needs to be key. done. Yeah. This yes. really needs to be done. And I'm really, really grateful to the Heiko University's great vision and, and sensitivity to this issue. And, and, uh, and I'm very proud to be a part of this uh, process to do this for the next generation okay. of filmmakers. I look forward to that movie and uh, see you. from my eyes how interesting and how different it will be. And uh, Joanna as well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Stephen Nia, of course, chairman of the World Film Institute. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.